Um, it hasn't rained today that much, but it's still super overcast. <clears throat> but um, yeah, mo Monday, Tuesday was amazing with the uh, tropical storm. It was crazy, like really <laughs> Where down at? the beach. So, but the kids are having a good time. That's all that matters. So it's fine. So you're and they the go out, right? They go out and about, right? Huh? The kids go out and about. They're 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 out, yeah, out they, of the house, right? Yeah, they're running around the beach, even though it's like a nightmare, and they're in the hot tub, and they're in the pool, and there's no lightning or anything, so they're fine. Right. They're having fun. So they Good. Where, where are you at? Uh, the Outer Banks, uh, Kerala. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I got one thing, though. You know, last night, um, I was at a, uh, my friend had a 70th birthday party on Zoom, and there were about, I think about 15 people. And it's like it's like a total shit show when everybody talks at the same time. So I don't know how, um, I don't know how to kind of conduct that. But I think everybody, who, every, we've all been doing these probably for the last month or something like that. But it's it's good to Raise just kind of take a, take a yeah. deep breath, <laughs> yeah. put, put a finger up or something. I mean, it's, and still, you guys help help. Con yeah. You guys help conduct it too, you know, because well, that's when it gets a, that's so when it gets a little crazy, you know. All and, simultaneously for the whole. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what Matt, happened? Though, we'll just go right over him and. <laughs> no, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It's a little bit of a yeah. shit. What works yeah. pretty good and worked last week was, you know, when the person's finished doing their thing, there's a little pause. Someone jumps in. If two people jump in, somebody defers and. It's actually okay, you know. It it, it can yeah. work really good if not everybody's drunk. Right. Well, if we drink every time somebody interrupts somebody, then there's a reward for everything. <laughs> Man, this may be the first one of these I've done without drinking. I don't know. <laughs> Usually home. Uh, so I guess John. Uh, oh, maybe here. Yeah, he is. Hey. All right. I'm eating lunch. Connecting to audio. Hey. Johnny, how's it going? Hey, you buddy. Know, we're just kind of getting rolling. So, do, do you guys does do which of you guys don't know each other? I mean, who John? Like, let's start with John Mahoney. Who do you who don't you know here? Well, I've known you for about fifteen years. I know Stuart yeah. for quite a while, and I yeah. met John when we did Gear Club about a year and a half ago uh, or so. Uh huh. And uh -huh. everybody else is new. So nice to meet oh, you all. Right. Good Hi, to John. Meet you. Hey, John. Hi. Yeah. Where, where I know I know John and I know the guy in the middle on the top. Can't remember his name. <laughs> about, we're all, we're all in different old, positions really. uh, on our different screens. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I've known That's... Pat for a long time. That's it. <laughs> I, I, th I think, yeah, the I think John's the only one I didn't know before. Hi, John. Uh, hey. I, I haven't seen Dave in a very, very long time, but uh, so he may not remember. It's good to see you, met, Pat. But, uh, of course. Good to see you. <laughs> Several of us have uh, Nile Rogers in common, I think. That's, uh, oh, yeah. James and Dave and I, sure. Well, you have parties at your studio, Pat, so that's... Uh, I that's do, I do. That doesn't mean uh, I remember meeting people. That's why I wasn't sure if I met John. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, yes, occasionally. Hey, Pat, speaking of Reservoir, what's the... Are you guys closed? <laughs> well, we're we as you know we have some production rooms there, uh, you know, and, and I have a mix room there, and those are anyone who's working alone. We're still doing things like that, but the main room, which is built around a lot of people squeezed into a room doing things, is not really happening. We're not doing. We haven't done anything there. We shut down a couple months ago, so uh, we're so you start, we're getting calls and we're figuring out our protocols and what's going to happen. Um, but it's yeah, it's it was a bad idea to start a studio five years ago and it's even better now <laughs> uh but we're gonna we're, we're hanging in there and uh you know hopefully it just doesn't look like things will change for a while so we're gonna have to come up with protocols that will work and uh, i don't want to hijack this whole thing talking about that but we have you know varying things of uv lights and foggers and all sorts of uh you know we bad sci-fi movie things we're gonna do and it, it should get us able to do some things because we do as, as you, you remember we have a very large lounge space which is helpful yeah. so yeah. when people aren't in the studio they don't have to be on top of each other right uh, but, 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 we'll you don't go in, but you don't go in uh, i have not been going in but uh I, I i've gone back a couple times to pick up drives and stuff i have a setup here in my place in connecticut but so i've been mixing quite a bit but 
uh, I would like to go. And I'm actually, I have a have some things I have to go back and do with clients that will be sort of just vocals or just mixing together, and those I'm willing to do. But uh, the, the main A room, that's a that's a thing we need to get right, and it'll take a minute to do that. But we're we're working on it now, and I think a lot of places are. I just I just don't know, you know, can't give any better idea than that. Right. So so you yeah, Greg. Stuart, you you're in the same boat. I think Peter. Cadis is in the same boat, Pat. I mean, you guys ultimately you have to feel comfortable with people coming in, right? I mean, if, I mean, you're you're going to be like the, uh, you know, the hair the hairdresser that's uh, got all the customers. I mean, there's only one customer, one hairdresser. Right. One barber, like, yeah, yeah. Twenty yeah. haircuts in one day. All of a, you know, so how you how are you guys feeling about? Well, about I having just people come in. A session with uh, with Shanahan, right? Yeah. He yeah. sat right across the room with the mask. You know, it wasn't a group of people. It was just one person. Yeah. Since masked. Um, and it was, you know, it worked. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not coughing yet, but. Um, <laughs> that it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send somebody else. Yeah. But, but in, in, as far as having multiple people, um, I don't, I'm with Pat and I guess Peter's in the same position. I don't, I don't know. Peter, are you having people over? No, I'm not, but I, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of several records. One of them is a band in England. It's like a big major label record. And I think that's just like on permanent hold for a while. And then another band from Toronto that we were really not close to being done recording and that's on permanent hold. But I was in, near the end of another record with a band from Boston who decided to try to finish the record on their own, uh, finish you know, all the vocal recording and some little instrumental stuff. And I'm mixing it here by myself, but with, again, the hours long Zoom calls every day. So, yeah. um, but it's, it's working. I mean, in a way, I don't mind being here alone. I kind of love being alone, to be honest. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we've all sort of gotten used to that a little more than in the past, but now it's on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my studio is only like a seven minute drive from my house. So it's, it's not really a big deal at all. And uh, no one else comes here. I mean, I have a downstairs studio. My my pal runs and uh, he he works down there, but you know, we, we never touch each other and we see each other from 20 feet away. That's it. So. Yeah. So, um, so we're going, right? So Greg, our co-host Johnny, right? We got Greg, uh, our old buddy. Mr. the cow be with us yeah, we, and and we kind of asked greg if he would come and be um a little partner with us on today's gear club and he hand chose these beautiful men all of them and i testify that they're all beautiful and maybe greg you want to say hi and then we'll have everyone just quickly introduce themselves sure well yeah we'll, we'll go around uh, i picked i, I actually picked I, like something that I've been kind of proud of over the years. I've only had dinner with one client in 47 years who I didn't like. So I really don't like hanging out with people just for business. And all the guys that I picked here are not only fantastic engineers and I've enjoyed working with them, but I really like all of them. And I've had so, some social time with each and every one of them. Some, some people like my buddy, James Farber, I've known since, uh, well, what do we say? 82 or something like oh, that. Oh no, I, like uh, be, late 70s. Before. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But I mastered your stuff back in 74 with the mini records, right? Yeah. So, so like 78 through 81, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. 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 That's a long, that's a long stretch, but you, you mastered a hundred uh, records for me before I met you. <laughs> it was all those Haitian records. Yeah. No, it was, it, it's, it was really, and, and then I finally, finally met him. And anyway, the, the point is that um, the reason that I picked the, the gentleman that uh, the viewers can see here, is that uh, first of all, they're all super talented, but second of all, they all work with me and other engineers, other mastering engineers. And they do that for reasons that we'll discuss today. And there's many different reasons. And uh, I, I really want this to be a focus on what uh, recording, mixing engineers and producers think about in terms of mastering when they're conceiving a project, when they're mixing rough mixes, when they're 
when they're recording, when they're mixing, what, when does mastering figure in? And then how does it end up getting to me or one of my, you know, my other buddies around the country and around the world who end up getting the work? And then ultimately what happens when the work is, is good? What happens when the work is bad? And the whole dynamic that goes on between producer, manager, label, recording engineer, mixer, and uh, mastering engineer. Because I think if you're not actually in the trenches in this business, I don't think you really actually understand how much interpersonal dynamics play into what we all do. How, how much pleasing and vibing has to work for something to really end up where everybody kind of comes into the mastering room at the end if they, when they used to come in and all say, wow, this was a great experience because there's lots of, uh, there's lots of bumps in the road. So um, that's essentially what, you know, I don't know if I've spoken to either of you guys about what my intention, intention here was, but it's really about you guys. And, I, you know, I'll bounce off when, when, I, when I can or when, when you ask me to. But um, as I said before, the ground rules are mention other mastering guys if you want or mastering women. Uh, bad mouth ones if you want or don't want. Mention names, don't mention names. Completely up to you, whatever your comfort level is. But I guess what we're trying to do, because we have an audience here, is to kind of educate people as to what happens in our in our day to day lives as uh, so called professionals in in the business. Well, the so, worst okay. master and engineer in the world is definitely just kidding. I would never say <laughs> the airing of grievances. <laughs> um, Who goes first? Well, why don't, we, why don't every, everybody just get a minute to introduce themselves? Uh, I think that one of, one of our most verbally uh, facile people is uh, Mr. Patrick Dillett. Who I speak. <laughs> you pick me first. <laughs> sit up in the corner and just uh, you know, tell, tell the folks who basically who I'm you just are, a what guy you do. With and... a dream. Uh, I am <laughs> I'm a, a New York based engineer and producer. I've been um, working for, I guess, a 30 plus years. I have, I'm also the owner of a studio called Reservoir Studios, which a lot of these guys here remember as Skyline. Um, and we've had that open for about five years. Um, I started working with Nile Rodgers and I've done a bunch of big time R&B pop records in the past. And now I do a lot of as big time as indie stuff gets, I guess. Um, but I basically work on things I like to work on. And uh, I'm very fortunate from years I've been doing this to be able to do that and uh, I hope you've liked something I did but I actually like a lot of the things everyone else here has done so I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and and, uh, you, you, you produce and you do produce and engineer right? You do yeah but I, I'm you know it's funny that uh, you know there's so many I, I, when I when I think about producing and I think that Quincy Jones is a producer I feel embarrassed that I am a producer as well uh, <laughs> but there are a lot of different ways to do it and uh, I do it from the side that I guess most of us do it where is it more of a technical thing where I am helping out with arranging and stuff but in general it's mostly about making it sound good making everybody have a good experience getting the right people in the room and you know getting it done I do things for the artist I try and make what the artist wants happen um, I think a lot of other producers are a lot more involved in making what they want happen for the artist. So, so in that sense, uh, I, I'm not shy about being a producer, but I don't want anyone uh, watching this to think I'm going to be making beats for them or arranging strings. Um, but but uh, because of the way the industry has gone, I think a lot of us as engineers get involved in the production because it's all sort of a one-stop shop. And if you have a studio and you're able to be a helpful participant in the production, and not, not just you know, titular producer, but actually, you know, making things better, that is produce, producing, but uh, I'm always, I'm always, I think of myself as an engineer and a mixer first before production, but I do, I do a little of everything. Producing without the points is really what it is. <laughs> not always, but yeah, not enough, yeah. never enough. Yeah. And I love uh, James, you're over in the corner here, so we're going uh, kind of across the board here. Okay, I'm in a different spot on everybody's screen, but uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, you're, but okay, I so started you... in the late '70s. I was uh, one of the original power station engineers, and uh, started out um, making a lot of Haitian compa records, which Greg mastered, as I said earlier, about a hundred albums for me before I ever met him. Then I got to choose who who I wanted to master with, and I said I might as well use this guy. And then we met, and we, we've been close <laughs> ever since. And masters almost everything I do. Um, 
I also met Dave at Power Station. And um, then I became the Power Station jazz guy because that's what I loved and musicians realized that. Uh, I left uh, in 84 and I became Niall Rogers' personal engineer for three years. We moved over to Skyline where I met Pat and we, uh, Niall and I made about a dozen kind of high profile R&B and pop records at that time. Um, after a few years, I left Nile and made a couple of other more, still some high profile pop records, but I was always doing jazz records. Um, some of the ones that I'm very proud of are the couple of ones I did for James Taylor, who Dave works with now. And uh, then in 88, since 88, I've just been a freelance um, jazz engineer in New York City working with um, some of the best musicians on the planet and uh, kind of loving it all. Um, I'll say one thing about, um, before I turn it over, that Greg said, when do you think about mastering? If somebody calls me to mix something, it's one of the first questions I ask them if they have mastering plans and who's gonna master. And depending on what they say may determine whether that discussion goes forward or not. So it's very, very important to me. And because I work uh, in a Stone Age uh, kind of manner on analog desks, uh, I think I have different, certain different considerations in mastering maybe than everybody else in some ways, which we'll speak about as we go along. So, um, but it, it's super important to me. And uh, I, you know, I can't say enough about how important it is. So I'll turn it back to you, Greg. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Dave. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. This is this is this is excellent. And uh, um, <laughs> it really is. I I started at Power Station in the mid '80s. Actually, I interned at a studio in Queens called the Workshop that Kevin Kelly owned. I don't know if you guys know him, but great little studio, great engineer, and uh, learned some good things there. And then I started at Power Station. You know, answering phones when they had the incredible staff, including James Farber, who was, you know, always highly regarded and did become the jazz guy. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I had a great time there, exposure to great music and musicians besides, the, besides all the engineers and worked there for several years, did, did some good projects, including Eric Clapton, I know I got to do some engineering with and uh, you know, it was back in the time when you would work on many different genres, uh, um, not just pop or rock, even though those are very similar. There'd be jazz, there'd be some jingles and everything, it was like in a New York minute, everything had to be really good and really quick. But uh, had a great time there, a lot of great engineers I learned from and then did go independent and do a lot of work with James Taylor, um, as James Farber mentioned and did his last several albums. And also uh, with James, I do production and recording and mixing. Like Pat, I, I will do production. I'm not gonna write string arrangements and this, that and the other, but I'll help the artists achieve what they're trying to achieve. And uh, also a lot of recording and mixing, uh, the last Cheryl Crow record, the Keith Richards last record, Cross-Eyed Heart and uh, did some work with John Mayer and a bit of Lyle Lovett, Milton Nascimento, people like that. And, and I also will do a lot of indie projects too that are less well known, but excellent music that, and that's a lot of fun. And um, of course I've come to love Greg's work, but I've, I've worked with many different mastering guys also, but I guess we'll get into that as we keep going. Yeah, I mean, my partner Ted uh, worked with uh, with Dave for many years, and uh, Ted Jensen, great engineer and great great partner and great friend of mine, uh, who now is down in Nashville. But uh, you know, it's uh, I, you know, I work with I work with Ted for I think it was like thirty six years <laughs> before right. he moved to Nashville. Now now I speak to him every month or two. It's kind of weird. I actually I gotta give him a call. I gotta talk to him about a car. But uh, anyway, <laughs> thank Dave. Thanks, Peter. Peter Cadis. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
You still making so, those cow? You doing those bounces in there, or are you ready to? No, I finished the bounces. Um, it's funny. I just looked at. I was looking someone up, and then I just looked myself up to try to remember what records, what bands I worked with. It's sort of like <laughs> when you go to try a guitar in a shop, you're like, "What? I don't know any songs." But um, <laughs> no, I guess I'm the indie rock guy. Um, I think the bands that I'm most associated with are bands like The National or Interpol. I, in fact, we met when you mastered the first Interpol record, I guess that was, yeah. August, that was spring of 2002. Um, a very, very pivotal record for me, uh, which I think I've told you, but that was, that kind of got, got me into a, a, a different part of the indie world. And I've been feasting on that meal for about 20 years now. Thank you very much. But uh, yeah, because it's, uh, it's a lot, you know, a lot of what we do has to do with the path that you end up taking based on records that are popular or not popular. And sometimes you can get trapped, you know, great engineers can get trapped in being great at heavy metal and then heavy metal goes out of fashion. Nobody calls them anymore. So, right. but you were, you know, you, you're in a great genre and a great part of that genre, Frightened Rabbit and, you know. The genre is you know, pretty wide protected. too. I mean, any rock yeah. and all sorts of things. So, um, but yeah, I made like eight records with the National. I'm trying to think of more. Uh, recent things. I finally got to work with Death Cab for Cutie last year, which was a lot of fun. Um, but um, I I came I came from more of like a DIY thing. I did work I did a, had some assistant jobs in studios in New York in the early '90s, but I primarily worked out of my parents' basement. And then a little over 20 years ago, I bought this giant old house in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and made it into a residential studio. Um, and I've been. I've been hoarding gear ever since, but the last few years, I don't really buy new gear anymore. I just pay money to fix it. So, um, I mean, I don't need all my stuff anymore. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff, <laughs> but um, that's what I try to explain to people. Like now, I mean, you have, I mean, I'm sure that people might disagree with me. You have computers with all these great plugins that can do so many different things. I mean, they had plugins 20 years ago, but they were, <laughs> a little bit crappy so like you needed weird compressors and preamps and mics to get cool sounds back then so um but yeah you could definitely travel a lot lighter these days i think but um and we can get into it later but i when it comes to mastering i think you know from the very beginning or at least like you know 25 years ago mastering to me was always like can they make it louder and brighter than i'm able to or willing to um and now that's not true at all but I, i've always i've always mixed as you know um sort of to get the final loudness even without mastering. And then I give you something that's back down a little and you see if you can make up that volume and, and, and make it sound better also. And now, and that's getting harder and harder to do because, well, for all sorts of reasons, but we'll talk about that. And, but that's become, that's become for, for me and the rest of the guys here, and you know, I'm not in touch with a lot of other guys in other shops, but um, we, get, we get the mix and we get the louder mix and you got to make the louder one a little louder and a little bit more dynamic. And that's, the, that's, that's what we do every day. That's, that's, that's what the job has become. And, uh, uh, except when J and James comes in with a, with a beautiful jazz recording and we just try to just squeeze as much life out of every single frequency and every single instrument and just see what happens when we plug different things in. But yeah, the job is, the job is changed and we'll kind of, we'll kind of get to that. But uh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, Humani. Love John. Oh no, uh, Stuart, are you gonna are you gonna participate as a no no as an no. Omani. No. John. Yeah. John, right. Okay. Hey. So I'm John Omani. I grew up in Ireland. I moved to New York in '98, and kind of grew up through the New York studio system as an assistant and then engineer. Uh, did a few things like that. Ended up working for Andy Wallace as his engineer for five years and then kind of gradually phase into just doing my own thing around, I don't know, 2007, something like that. Uh, work out of a, my own studio in Dumbo in Brooklyn. Um, I've been working with Greg for about 15 years. Uh, quickly touching on mastering, it is the conversation that I fear the most when I'm mixing a record, like who <laughs> they may want to master the record or who gets to choose the mastering engineer. It's really important to me that I get to, to forward my list of candidates. Uh, sometimes if there's like an album that's been already kind of in the works and I'm hired to just do maybe two singles or something, I might not get to choose. And those moments are frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. That's, uh, and that's the whole group. So I'm going to, you know, I have a couple of things to kind of, to kind of get the ball rolling, but um, I guess part of it was just discussed uh, 
by a few of you guys right now. Like, what happens? Um, when are you consulted about the mastering? Like, when do you? When in the process do you know who's going to master it, and does that impact the way you mix? I think that's kind of my that's kind of my overall thing. Um, how how it has how, no, um, it has. Sorry, I thought you were done. I was just gonna yeah. say I have no. It has no impact in how I mix. Really, I mean, right. it's if I know I'm gonna master with you, I have the confidence that you're not going to screw it up because i mean that's your everyone's biggest fear that the mastering guy will change it arbitrarily it's, you know something you've worked weeks or months on and in a few hours they're just going to make some you know random decisions um but i i don't really think about it at all and i i almost never say well, well let's save that for mastering okay yeah. if you don't like it now i don't think you're ever going to yeah. like it so but that's around yeah, definitely that <laughs> definitely the fix it at mastering is a slippery slope well, just a question. Do all you guys attend mastering? I try I to do. all the time. All I the do time. about 100% of the time. You do? I try to, but Greg moved to Jersey. Yeah, know. that was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you usually end up at your place after mastering with Greg. So. Yeah. yeah, it was the thing. It's like you've, 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 you've killed the social time I have with Peter by being... He doesn't come <laughs> by my place anymore because it's not in the same... <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, it's great to go, but it's, you know, with part of, I, I mean, I don't want to hijack here, but the part of the whole thing that works with a mastering engineer that you trust is you trust them and then they know what you want, they know what you do. So you, it's great to be there for a lot of reasons, but it's also like once you've built a relationship with a mastering engineer or several, it's, you should be able to not go if you don't. Right. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit of a leading question for me because probably unlike everyone else, I I have and Greg knows this, I've backed off from going. And for me personally, it has a lot to do with trusting Greg, uh, you know, implicitly. Mm -hmm. But also I'm not sure what my contribution is there. Like, I would rather, like, not be, and Greg and I have talked about this, I'd rather not be leaning over his shoulders, listening to speakers that sound different than mine, and going, hmm, and then I start making suggestions based on something that I'm not quite sure about. So, um, and, and in the case with Greg, I've had, like, amazing luck doing that, not going, <laughs> which is why then we have to make up time to go out and have dinner. So... <laughs> Right. It works that way too, but 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 probably unlike everyone else in the room, I because I know Aniello is a goer, right? Johnny, no, <laughs> not anymore. John, John would run and run the tape machine when he would come in. Well, right, that, but that was years ago. That when was, you were going, when you were all on tape, he would come in with a big box yeah, of tape but, and say, but "This is the... maybe why, like maybe eight years ago, because it it's been a while since I've been." coming well, over. The tape. And, and my, my yeah. thing is I always joke was I would come over for the lunch. I'd get the free lunch. Yeah. I was yeah. fucking psyched on that. <laughs> right, but Jersey's a whole different <laughs> story, Greg. But, but you no. know, I got I got I got to explain something. Each, each one of you guys like uh, uh John, I don't think maybe you came I think you came over a couple of one, once or twice in the early days of uh coming over, but then you know, for the last four or five years, I, you know, we, we went to dinner, but I really get to see you firsthand, yeah. right? Yeah, well, Dave I mean, comes in with it. Dave, at Dave the comes start, in it was you. like, it was like going to get your paper graded by the headmaster. I used to come for that, <laughs> you know, to just see how I did. And I mean, especially the early days with Greg, I went because I was learning tons about what I needed to deliver to master. That's totally like, where I'm coming from too, right? In the beginning, I wanted to know what happened. Like, uh, did the mastering guy do nothing? Or did he say this is garbage and completely change it? You don't know if you don't go. I mean, obviously you'll hear the master, but I loved all my mastering experiences going and watching what, what you were doing or, or, or even other people. But uh, yes, the, <laughs> you know, I think we started work, since we started working together, I've worked with you 90 something percent of the time. So, yeah. and, and, and I'll say this, your new room sounds incredible. And but the old room, I really struggled with those pro acts. To me, they were just yeah, like like razor sharp, and I was terrified. Yeah. If, even to the I last day, turn, I, I always had to turn down. I always had well, that the comfort level in this room is definitely people really find this new room much more familiar to their ear. The other room was an adjustment; people enjoyed it, but I think they kind of backed off. It was a little more jagged. But I got to say that each one of each one of you guys, uh, Pat, when you come in. 
I mean, I'm, I'm maybe different than mo most management guys don't want to have anybody in, in the room. I mean, I, I, uh, I know Ted one time uh, was working with somebody um, <laughs> for about six hours and the guy was in the kitchen. And, uh, and I said, had the session. I said to the guy in the kitchen, Ted was still in the room. I said, had the session go. He says, hey, everything sounds really good. It's kind of weird. He never talks. I said, he never <laughs> talks because I never stop talking. That's my problem. I even take, I take an hour of studio time off if I talk too much. I say, I'm not billing for talking because I just, I just get wound up and start asking about all shit that, that I missed by being a mastering engineer, by not being in recording, not knowing how to set microphones up, not knowing why this hi-hats are too loud. And, you know, I had to ask these questions because I remember the three years that I was in the studio and it's so fascinating to me. So that's how, I, you know, you guys maybe come in and learn something from me, but I learn way more by finding out what, you know, what, how come how this sounds like this? sounds so bad? <laughs> yeah. Who put this part? Who put this I, I mean, I've been in the studio. I don't know how you could do this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when, yeah. I, I'm just going to say, like, when Pat comes in, he has a, a, an affinity for like 400 cycles. He likes warm. And uh -huh. even though he was even though he wasn't in my room that much, when he comes in, he knows what he heard in the studio, and maybe. He knew it when the mixes were done, he listened, well, yeah, this is something we should look at on the other set of speakers. Then he would come in and I would say that the, the, it comes out better when somebody is working with me and I feel they understand the speakers. James, James and I work way better when James is in the room. There's no doubt about it. We, we, we go super slow to try to get all the patching set up and all the level set up and all the gain structure set up. And it's a very slow, you know, sometimes James's uh, musician clients want to come in. What do you, you if it starts at 12 o'clock, what time do you tell them to come? Like one or two, right? Uh, I would like to. They they like to come early, though. But they understand <laughs> that that they just sit back for a while while we uh, deal with subtleties for a while. But one of the main reasons I go is for the hang. But the second one is the, the collaboration. We're often listening to very subtle changes before any equalizer or any processing gets turned on. <clears throat> We're trying to find out the best signal path that brings out the, the best in my mix. And that might be a little more analog versus dig digital gain or vice versa. Too much analog gain, it might get stuffy. Not enough uh, might come unglued. Um, you know, we, uh, Greg's one of the few guys who will change a, a cable to make a different sound. And sometimes one cable compared to another one makes something sound like, makes it sound like two different mixes. So sometimes um, we listen to these things for a while and maybe spend two or three hours on the first song to get this stuff right before anything else happens. And uh, it would, it's really important for us to bounce these subtle decisions off each other. Like he'll like one thing, I'll like another thing and we'll explain why it is. I'll say, you know, well, the, the resonance of the bass is not happening for me the way I see upright bass on that one, that wire the way it should, or with that gain structure, or something feels a little harsh to me on a saxophone with that one compared to this. And then yeah. I'll say, okay, I see what you mean. I was listening to sort of something else, this certain tightness or, or something that appealed to me. And well, you know, whenever we disagree on something, I usually say, okay, do, do your thing. But I always feel I can contribute something by being there. Oh, there's, there's, yeah. There's no well, that's, it. Just, sorry. Yeah, my my uh, there's there's a quote from years ago. I'm not going to mention the the, uh, the mastering guy uh, who this was attributed to, but um, the quote was when, when the mixer came in. He said he said to the he said to the mixer. He says, "Well, it was your record, but now it's my record." The mastering Ooh. guy. So there are some guys who take the very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, right? But some guys are very territorial. I work in the complete opposite way because I feel like you guys do the work going on, going in. You've already like it. If you don't like it more after it comes to me, why would you tell the next client to use me if you didn't get what you wanted? So, and I, I say this to Sharon, uh, uh, my manager, Sharon is John, uh, John and Yellow's wife. And I say this to all my managers. I said, you, it, don't worry about the artist, worry about, you know, the artist has to be happy, but the most important thing is that the mixer and the engineer, the engineer be happy. If they're happy, they're going to recommend you. If, if the record somehow didn't work out and represent what they're proud of, I'm not going to get that recommendation anymore. And I, you know, I've actually made, I've actually made uh, LP references for people years ago with, with the EQ that they wanted, just so they had something to play their friends or their, their <laughs> clients that was the record that they wanted to come out. So I always work backwards that way. I don't work, I don't work forward, I, you know, and, and uh, 
it's just, it's worked, it works for me. I, and I feel it helps in the collaboration. You know, I don't like, like I've been getting, lately I've been getting people with like, uh, oh, yesterday, this is really good. And it sounds fantastic, but I, I think it could sound more fantastic. So I think because I'm like old now, they don't want to insult me or something like that. It's very weird. It's like, it, it sounds great. And then they give you like a revision note. I love the, I love the mastering. It's great. And then there's like 12,000 things they found wrong with it. It's like, what do you, you know, I'm not a baby. You know, I don't know if you guys have this. I don't know if you ever find this in your own relationships with your with your clients, but you know, just come to the point, man. What do you, what are we what are we doing? What's the work? You know. Well, I I am a little point. bit of a baby. Like I get I get uh, deeply hurt anytime anyone you know says anything negative about a mix, and I get over it very fast, almost immediately. But it, my initial <laughs> thing is like, oh, how could you? And, um, but nowadays this thing happens, and I think I heard like uh, some people talking about it on, on an audio podcast. Oh, nowadays you work so hard in a mix with a band out there, you send it to them. And they don't say this is sounding great. They just send you recall notes, like a lot of them. And then sometimes you just feel like, going, couldn't you just say it's sounding really good first? You know, it's just, <laughs> it's hard. So at least you're getting uh, the compliment, Greg. For yeah, yeah exactly. it. it's like yeah. They, yeah. they send you 260 tracks to sort through, and then they go yeah. straight to the one thing they don't like in the bridge. All right. <laughs> I say, well, I you know, always, always prefer to go to mastering, but. You know, when you work with somebody a lot, like Greg, we've we've done enough now that I totally trust you and I know what you're gonna do. And if I think it needs something, I would let you know. And if I think, oh, just let him do his thing, I won't say anything. You, you know, you hear it and do what you think you need. Yeah, but, but I've, I've, learned to, project. I've learned to read your facial expressions though. I really have. <laughs> I can always tell, I can, I can tell the intonation when you say something sounds good. I say, no, he's not sold on that. He's still, uh, it's still something there's a, you know there's all these uh, I think cues. It, I think because we you know it depending on the project as mixers recorded producers everything you yeah. you have an emotional involvement to the music that you're aware of and you feel and even if I go into a different room where I don't know the speakers exactly we all we can always a b and I kind of know what I want to get out of it but if you're hearing it and you know musically it's not right um because of a minor EQ adjustments and it's amazing that what what a little amount will do like James was saying changing a cable or use this compressor or that one but it all in the end it's just the feeling you get I think. Hey, hey Dave Stewart here J just speaking of the cable thing we just got hit from someone on YouTube there's a whole bunch of questions which I will not answer but one of them was can a regular music lover hear the diff in a cable or is yeah. that you think just for us? Like, do you depends think how much they love music and what they're listening on? Well, no. If you're in Greg's room though, and he shows yeah, you the difference, I've, been, I've had band guys in there, and they're like, "What the?" You know, like they can't <laughs> believe they can they can hear the difference in the cables. I mean, I feel like you shouldn't, but you can. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first time I noticed it was when Greg showed me something, and funnily now, anytime I've gone by, we always end up going back to the same cables for all my mixes. There you go. Okay. Is that right? Yeah, there's certain, there's certain, you know, you guys all have a style and some, some things just work for, for some guys, but I have to say, even though like uh, John, we do the in, we, indie stuff, Pat, we, you know, we do a little bit more of the acoustic, uh, you know, not acoustic pop, but, you know, acoustic music, rhythm music, but this all comes from working with James and Joe Furla, where we, we started to dig in with the jazz and I started to learn the textural differences with the signal path, which I, I kind of knew that go or years ago because I used to listen to Doug Sachs's records uh when he in the 70s and they sounded I knew that it wasn't just dial twisting I knew that it, my phone is ringing I gotta turn it off I knew it wasn't dial twisting that was doing that I knew it was hardware so I always knew and Sterling always had very very little very it was very basic hardware great stuff everything was in really good shape but you weren't swapping things out so I only started doing that when my jazz guys uh, Joe Furl and James we started to really th talk about a signal path and I, and and i learned again this is something i learned by talking to people about recording we all we all listen the same way we just have different uh access to different elements of, of this of the stuff so um but you know e each one of you guys the, um, the reason that sometimes it's good to come in and not come in like Stuart, your stuff is always balanced perfectly balanced and it's just really a it's a tonal adjustment bass and treble and it's like a speaker it's really a speaker adjustment really you know, and you get to know if you've got, if got some guys mix on certain speakers and you know it with their stuff, leave everything intact, but just kind of, it's like a bass and treble control and mastering. 
and then there's all, all the level stuff and everything, which we can kind of and get Greg, into. A lot of that came from you correcting me years ago. You know, it came from a lot of trial and just in terms of my room itself was like, hey, you know, there was a time when you were going to me, something's with the bottom in your room. And I had to really kind of learn what that was. And that was, I can't thank you enough for that. That was really. Uh, well, it's, this, is, this is why it's good for, especially engineers, you know, obviously now nobody could travel, but I mean, especially guys like John, you work, John and Yellow, John, you work in so many different places and constantly have to pivot and learn. And, you know, anybody that does that, you know, I'm, I'm happy when they call up and say, just, look, can I just send a mix and just give me a, give me a ballpark? Where, where am I at? And I have, you know, my friend Mark Dotson in England, he's, he's set up a home studio for the last six months. He sends me stuff like every other week. He's, he's moving the things in the corner. He's moving them back. He's moving the console up. What does this sound like? Well, you know, so I'm sitting in the same place. Literally, the old room, I was in the same room for 20 years with the same speakers. And, you know, I'm there all the time. You guys are, are pivoting. Uh, Peter Cadis has got a little different, little different situation because he's, you know, he's got his own, he's home and he's got a, an amazing studio. And, uh, but when you, when you started your new studio, uh, what was it, like two years ago now, Peter, when you moved to the, you moved, you moved out and then. Uh, well, what, five years ago, we moved, I moved out of this living in this house with the band. Um, right. The yeah. studio stayed, the family left. The studio stayed. And I, I tried to set up a studio in the new house or, or like a little mixing room. But it, it didn't quite work out. But I do now have Ted Jensen's BMW 801s and right. the Class A power up there, and it's 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 something else. But I, I wanted to say one quick thing that you know, you know, when you try to improve a mix, it's such a profoundly subjective thing. And like, I think if uh, if you remember a record you did a few years ago for me, a real rockin' record, and it I think it blew your mind a little that the main guy who was very hard to please came back <laughs> with uh, the statement, uh, "It sounds 10% better." And I like it 10% less. <laughs> That's a tough one. It was such a classic. That was, I, I, that was an absolute classic. That's good. <laughs> Statistics, sir. Like but, it, like, you know, it's actually, it's like a yogiism almost, right? Yeah. <laughs> because it kind of does make sense. You know, sometimes yes, something it can does. sound, it does make sense. you know, people will say, well, every, I don't know if you guys get this in mixing, but somebody, it's, it's too hi-fi, you know? I go, you yeah. know, it's like an indie rock record. They say it's too hi-fi. Yeah. Aren't, isn't it supposed to sound better? I mean, doesn't, uh, to me, hi-fi is like, you know, more open, clearer, cleaner, but they don't want that. They want it dirtier or overdriven or it's whatever. It's like David was saying, though. I mean, you, you basically, there is a thing you're looking for in it, and it's not necessarily the sound. You want that what that feeling that, that you get when you hear it. And if, if clean doesn't give you that feeling, it doesn't matter how good it is. I've spent, I mean, especially in the 80s, hearing... There are so many things that it was just people like, look, check out my snare, and and what the song sucks, and you're, you're just like it was. People were so hung up on on samples, you know, the early parts of sampling and looping and stuff, where it was just like, check it out. It's like, but 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 that's the only good thing. Well, before I worked with you, Greg, I, I used to work a lot with a guy named Alan Douches at West West Side. Yeah. You know, great engineer, great guy, and I think every time I'd go there, it was it was to try to learn. But I'd always be asking him questions and asking him, you know, help me be better. And I, I always thought his answer would be something like, oh, you've got to buy this compressor or whatever. And then one time he, I was, it, I was think I was just like, help me be better. And he's like, oh, just uh, record better bands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would not be more true. So. Yeah, we all, we all know that's, that's the key. So uh, there's one like, kind of, a, you know, I had a couple of like pr prepared questions. One of the questions that I was really, and I wanted everybody to try to remember has anybody finished ever finished a project and really hoped that the mastering was going to improve it or really did it? You know, in other words, it's finished, but you kind of, you know, you're fucked. It's like not right for whatever reason that so you got pushed in the wrong direction. You got, you got stuck with me with uh, some multi-tracks that were no good, but you really, you, you went to the mastering really knowing that you were in trouble. And then I'd like to, you know, if you have any stories and then whether it worked out or how you handled it with, you know, because you're kind of in the middle, you've already gotten paid by the guy who hired you, but you kind of have this sinking feeling. Now you have to kind of sell the mastering and you know, you're kind of in the middle of trying to protect your, your reputation and your pride, but yet you know, you know something needs to be done. So I'm, I'm curious if, if you guys have had any of those experiences. I had one, uh, actually not that long ago. Um, an artist that uh, a producer I work with a lot and actually Peter works with a lot, uh, uh, Thomas Bartlett, 
uh, we had done a, a this really great R&B record, this great singer. Uh, she was having so much trouble and we did the album over and over several times she re-recorded it. And she loved it sounding just dense and murky and that was cool. Uh, but it was just too dense and murky and there was no chance we were gonna go do mixes again. So I actually, actually Chris Geringer ended up doing it and, and Chris is great at a lot of things but he's particularly good at just like gonzo he would run in and really dug into it and I told him go for it <laughs> and he did a great job and he really uh, uh, made it into you know you have to get it something into the lanes are wide but you have to you have to be somewhere in one of the lanes and this would have just fallen into well it's sort of R&B but it's so indie sounding but it's not you know it would have been one of those what do we do with it and it, it didn't end up being a hit record or anything but it was it was so vastly improved and and, and it, I really like the record, always like the record, and now I, I like it better after mastering. That was pretty how, rare. How did the like artist, that. how did the artist react to the mastering? If the artist she wanted, loved it. To, to, she loved it. <laughs> but Pat was. We just have to sort of hear it and not go through the process. Like if we had had to say we're going to go back and do all the mixes again and make them that way, I think it would have been a harder sell. Uh -huh. But to just have it appear in this way formed a little more. I mean, the foundation of it was good, I think. I mean, I think even within the confines of how we were doing it and mixing it, it was, it was already good. It wasn't, a, I, hope, I don't think it sounded terrible, but it was, it was just, it was, it needed a lot of surgery in a very specific couple of areas. So. But, but Pat, was that a, a sonic issue or an, or an arrangement issue? Um, I think, I, I think that was actually, I, I appreciate you're trying to give me an out here, but I think it was a sonic. <laughs> I think <laughs> it really was. I mean, I, I was doing the bidding, but I think it was also, you know, I, it was the way to go while we were doing it. I think it was a lot of the, the choices sonically were just thick. I don't think it was so much. I mean, the arrangement was obviously thick as well, but it was the sounds themselves could have probably been pared down a bit and, and made to work, but it would have been a harder process, especially under that particular circumstance. So not usually the way I would go. But. And uh, I, I mean, like I, I said earlier, any anytime, sorry, second, that um that I've counted on mastering to make it better, I've been disappointed. So I, I never I never count on that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's again why I mix with the whole volume thing when you know I get really confused when people say they don't mix for volume and then their songs get, you know, mixes get jacked up six dB. Like that would that would make my mixes sound insanely different. So mm. I don't know, but I know people do that. I just, uh, do I just- mix analog? Do you mix the um, tape? I, I mix, I do mix analog. I, I mean, I go through my half inch machine every day, but I, in the last couple of years, I've been printing to it very rarely, but I have a very elaborate uh, analog summing chain. And right. just this week or last week for the first time in my life, I mix, uh, one, not in my life, in, in year, many, many years, over a decade or two, uh, I'm mixing a record in the box because the band is, I don't, I don't want to be mean to them because I'm working with them and they're wonderful, wonderful people and the record's great, but they, their tastes are so unusual. Like, yeah, most bands just, Greg always says, I'm going to give you, I'll give you this version, then I'll give you one that's a little louder. But if you let them hear both, they're always going to pick the louder one. Not right. true with this band. They want it quieter and quieter. They want the drums lower and lower and lower. And um, uh, what was the point? Oh yeah, I, I had so much trouble with the first song and they were just never happy with it that I, I couldn't make it as wimpy as their rough their rough mix. So I said, I'm gonna try something. And I just put it in the box, it got a lot wimpier and they love it. So I, and again, that sounds like I'm making fun of them, I'm not. But it's just, it's, it is a different thing. I don't know, it's uh, and, and I can't, I used to, what's that? I used to lament it, but I don't think I could ever mix it. Is it dainty in the right amount? I'm working on it, we're getting there. <laughs> So we'll see. We'll see. Greg, you 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 have something to look forward to in this too. You know. But by, by the way, before they came back, I'll make it sound worse. Said, Don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna be an absolute nightmare. They told me that. I said, oh, awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting what you say, Peter, about you know uh, bringing your mixes up six dB would ruin them. I always mix since I'm always mixing on an analog desk, and um, I would say more than half the time to tape and not bouncing the tape, but bringing the tape to mastering. So everything that I bring to mastering needs an average of 6 dB boost. So when I go to mastering, one of the critical things is how does 
what I did get preserved? And how does it get made louder without sounding like it got made louder? And that requires two things. Um, requires a great set of ears and, and it also requires really good, and I hate to say it, expensive gear um, because e everything has a sound. And, um, you know, if I am gonna mix the tape and I won't mix the tape, which I like to do as much as possible, but of course it's often a budget issue, um, but I won't do it unless they guarantee me that either Greg or Mark Wilder would be mastering the project. And if they say, no, we don't, we can't do that. I'll say, okay, we're not mixing the tape. But anyway, there's always um, um, around 6 dB or more of gain being added to what I do. So it's really critical how that, where that gain comes from. And that's one of the things we spend a lot of time on. And um, so I think that's a, a little, a very different experience for me in mastering than probably everybody else who's, I don't use a limiter at all. And the reason is I don't own any gear unlike everybody else. And what is in studios where I work is not the same quality that I would find in a great mastering studio. So I leave limiting till the end. I'm not shy with bus compression as Greg knows, but, um, mm -hmm. but that, that, that gain is like, critical. Somebody's really got to know how to do this in an elegant manner and preserve the nature of, of what I did. And of course, help it if I screwed up. But I do have a story about screwing something up, uh, a, a quick one. Uh, mixing with two guitar players, um, mixing all night, and one of them kept wanting to be louder, and the other one defended himself, and he made himself louder. The bass player wasn't there, and nobody defended him. We stayed up all night, went to Greg uh, mastering for mastering the next morning without sleeping. And we started to play the mixes and well, we all realized like, oh, there's no bass. So Greg had to figure out a way to add maybe five dB of bottom in some way to make the bass heard without destroying everything else. And he did it and it sounded great, but we've all been led astray by, you know, yeah. things uh, being pushed in the wrong direction at times. But, but Greg, so in terms of getting Jim his six dB. Oh, call me Jim. James. Sorry. <laughs> where do you go for that? Like, well, like, where do you start looking for your six dB? What, you know, is it EQ or is it? No, like, no, 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 it's not, it's not EQ. It's just, it, it, the, see, the thing is that James, he, the bus compression that he uses eliminates a lot of the problems that you would normally have just by boosting something, right? Because he, he's a masterful at doing a bus compression that actually doesn't sound like compression. And the amount of compression that he uses when he tells me, I don't even believe it. It's just, you just don't hear it. I, I, don't, I don't know. And you say you don't have your own gear and you don't even work, do it in different studios. So, so there is, there is headroom because there's no jagged peaks. I mean, the, the thing that you have your real problem with digital is that when you have these really quick jagged peaks, that just kind of just distort. I mean, they just pure distort. So we have, we do have some headroom to be able to bring it up digitally. And then, you know, we kind of figure out where, where to hit the, uh, you know, we have we, that, the, uh, that PL2 uh, that I use always kind of takes out some of the peaks. We try to, we try to kind of divide the, uh, the peak control up through two or three different uh, compressors or, uh, or brick wall. So and we kind of figure out, but the, the thing tape, is, the tape is, uh, provides like two or three dB, dB of natural yeah. limiting, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. And transient yeah. controls too. Yeah. But also you're, you're fortunate because, you know, I mean, every once in a while, somebody wants something louder, right? But very rarely, you pretty much know how to handle the client in terms of getting the level thing not to be the important thing. Like let, let the, you know, it's, 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 a, it's really difficult yeah, to do that. They just want it to sound musical. But, I know, but these these guys are all in a different realm where when people when stuff's not loud enough, people listen to it off their phone or on their laptop, and you just have to figure out a way to make it loud. And you know, this is you know this is the old level wars conversation that you know we could have just. A, I, I refuse to spend all the time here talking about that, but everybody has to find that their way of getting that client to listen to those mixes and be confident that they're going to be able to compete. Everybody uses the word well, we want it to compete but we don't want it to sound <laughs> compressed but not realizing that you know it only can go so high and then there's nothing on top you know 
it's the uh, it's the fish tank with the glass on top. That's the one I, I was said to me one time. Digitally, you do, you you wait, put the waves, and the waves are only going to hit the top of the glass. That's it. That's it. Now, everything else is all illusion. So you have to kind of create the illusion of of volume. You have a you have a music a jazz. It's a kind of music where the dynamics really, when they're gone, the rhythm is gone. I mean, there's nothing backing it up. You know, if the bass if the bass is not twanging and not banging, and it's, it's, then the player is not playing properly, you know? So it's kind of, you, you guys all, Dave, I, uh, I think you kind of have done both. I mean, with James, uh, you have a real musician, a kind of a acoustic musician stuff, and you also have kind of a, a sound to make, like a, a presentation to make, that it's not just a guy sitting in a room with a bunch of musicians, right? And this is, this is an art. I mean, it's a huge art as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think, I think it's different on different projects. And and I should say mastering is hugely important to me. Sometimes people will ask me, if, you know, if I'm mixing something, are, are you gonna have somebody master it or do you master it? To which I'll say, oh, I, I always want somebody else to do that. First of all, a professional who does that for a living. And second of all, a different set of ears, but it's different on different projects. With James Taylor, of course, it's one approach where I, the, the peak limiting thing, you know, the big issue with that is that it works for some music and not for others. So there's just musically, there's going to be an imbalance of levels between different projects. Mm -hmm. But and I've done both and I like them both to a degree. But, you know, it varies on different things. And I was going to say earlier, I never had a, pro a project where I thought it was a real problem. But like Greg, you did the Cheryl Crow record, which had a lot of songs of different <laughs> vibes of, of some similar musicians, but different things, but mixed in different studios over uh, more than a year where there was no way mix wise, I was gonna have everything match. And it was hundred percent a thing that all that was gonna happen in mastering. I mean, you always thought of mastering is where you, you take the songs and you, you, you touch up the bottom and the top and make sure the vocal levels match. But that, you know, that was a project where Plus, <laughs> you know, uh, we were there was a push to to get a hot level and. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> worked hard. Greg worked hard on that. It was a huge. The mastering was a huge I, part I don't of the sound mind, of the record. I, I don't mind mentioning Steve Jordan because he's he's such a great friend and I know yeah. you feel the same way. But it, 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 the process does not end in, in the mixing when it comes to Steve. He he wants more more everything it's you know it's like more everything it's like come in with more you know more more groove more more punch more more everything and you just keep going for it and he has the patience and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun but you as the mixer when you're in the room sometimes i feel like what you know i want you to make i want to make sure that all the work you did going in is 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 okay for me to go in and start to take a pair of pliers and start to like let's let's rip this apart here but you know the results are good it's just it takes it's it takes work there's i mean there's there's so many different aspects to this job, depending on the people who bring it to you, you know, and, and get, getting a read on that is, is, you know, I mean, people call up and go like, it sounds this, what, what did you do anything? It sounds just like what you gave me. I said, it sounded great. What do you want me to ruin it? That's why it sounded great. What more do you want out of it? Well, we thought maybe, uh, you know, Greg Calby was going to, I said, but no, I, what am I going to do? I only have a certain amount of tools here. Why would I change it? Just, just to change it for the fuck of it. I don't do, I mean, I just don't do that. Maybe some guys do it, you know, so that's not the way I work, but it's all like, it's all client, you know, it's all client based. Um, Can I add to and, this, Greg? Yeah. Sure. What's that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think with the whole loudness conversation and everything, which we will resist to getting into because obviously that could go on forever. I mean, yeah. that's why it's so important to develop a relationship with the mastering engineer or a couple of mastering engineers that you choose to use because you can tackle all those problems together and like all, in all my time working with Greg we have a a way of dealing with it uh, that we're kind of on the same team like we're not fighting each other on the level I'm not giving you I'm hopefully not presenting you with something that you can't work with and I'm you know you're able to kind of tell me what you need and we figured it out uh, but that's where it becomes terrifying when somebody you don't know is going to master your record because they don't know those little details and nuances of how it's set up. So like for years, through conversations with Greg, it helped inform my choices of equipment, how I was going to use it, how much limiting I would do in the mix. I like to mix with limiting on because I want to mix towards the loudness. If I mix without loudness and then it becomes loud later, the balance of my mix is going to get messed up, right? So I gave up doing that a long time ago. 
and then I'll give Greg the, my limited mix, but I'll also give him a, like a, a feed before the limiter and I'll give him the settings of my limiters so that I'm almost like creating an insert point where you can jump in to the limiting with headroom, but you can- I do the same thing, same thing. So we've been doing yeah, that for that many years. Like, <laughs> that solved yeah. the problem for me, but I can't do that with just anybody. You know, I can't talk to some mastering engineer who never worked it before. We own different gear, we're hearing it different. <laughs> Those relationships are vital in this business, I find, to, to protect what you're doing and also to be able to, you know, have that open dialogue and help get the client what they need. Uh, absolutely. See, this, is, this is what I'm, I'm so, I'm so uh, interested in finding out is that how do you, look, look, everybody here works for, pretty much works on projects that other people are financing and they, the decision to, for the mastering, I, I, when it, whenever somebody calls me, you know, it happened, it happened recently that somebody uh, was mixing with Bill, Bill, Bill Schnee out in California and Bill works, I, I, I forgot who he works, he works at Bernie Grumman, I think, right? So my client who I've done 50 records with, he called me up very apologetic. He said, um, you know, I got to say this record, uh, it's an orchestral record and I know you do a great job, but Bill insists on working with Bernie. I said, why would you think I would want to work with Bill because you pushed him. There's nothing worse than somebody all squirrely coming over to me, right? And because he's pushed by the owner of, you know, the guy with the, basically the guy with the money, because the guy with the money has their relationship. So I, I always discourage anybody for going to the plate for me. I said, just make everybody comfortable. You don't need that kind of source at the end of a project. It's just not, it's just, it's not healthy for the, for the, for the, the final result. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have been in situations where maybe you had arguments with, with clients about mastering, or maybe, I'm, you know, I'm curious as to what happens when you get, oh, hey, 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 John, would you listen to this and tell me what you think of it? And then you listen to it and, it, and you hate it. And then what happens? Because the money's been spent, right? They made the decision and now you got to keep a good relationship with your, with your producer or your label person. I mean, what happens in that situation? Is it, does it get ugly or is, can it be nuanced or how does that work? Well, I try to tell people as early as I can that like, look, if you're hiring me because you like my mixes and you like what I'm doing, and then you like what we did together, why on earth would you go to anybody else other than a guy that I recommend? You know, the chances of it, the only time I, I feel that that's probably appropriate is if somebody was unhappy with what the mixer did and they're trying to rescue it through a, a uh -huh. call of their own. And sometimes it can be difficult. Like you could be working for an A&R guy who has been taking all of his records to this one mastering engineer for 20 years. So, yeah. and you do have to respect other people's relationships, but you just try to have the conversation. You try to, to make them see that, look, you might have a guy you want to use and it's not that he doesn't know what he's doing. It's just that I don't have that relationship with him. You know, I don't have that dialogue with him. We don't have 15 years under our belt of doing things together. And I think there's been only one other mastering engineer, a friend of mine called Ian Sefcik out of Capital Mastering. He's the only guy I've done records with in the last 10 years where like he kind of got it. And when he first asked me, I, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, when he first asked me to let him try some records, I was like, look, you know, Greg's been my guy forever. Um, you know, that's not really going to change if you want to tackle one of these indie records. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I respect that relationship you have with Greg. But um, but I'd love to try some stuff. And I met him because he builds equipment. He builds mastering compressors under the name Magic. He's a nice fellow. I met him, I met him out there. He, but has, has anybody had this situation where they just went ape shit when they heard that thing get destroyed and then they had to, they had to go to the plate and kind of risk a relationship or something? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always curious about yeah, that. Yeah, I think you you got a call like that from me recently, Greg. Oh, I, I certainly- Or we had to redirect someone, something. A certain someone, yeah, okay. We'll, yeah. Lay, we'll lay off that one because we can- you know, <laughs> It's a no-win situation. I had one years ago where um, we, I tracked a band up in Dreamland, a big bass drum, double head, like maybe 26 or something, really. But the whole basic tracks, the drum sound was this really beautiful, booming bass drum. And Greg, it was one of the ones where the label, the indie label, decided they had a guy. And I got right. back to mastering, and the mastering engineer had rolled all the bottom <laughs> off of the record because he felt like um, <laughs> it was too boomy. Mm -hmm. And I got on the phone with him. I had to say, dude, you know, don't fix my record. <laughs> like, it's not wrong. It's not broken. You know what I mean? When I send you the record, this is what it's supposed to sound like. You may think it's something, but I'm not, you know, I'm not giving it to you to fix. 
and he had to redo it and I had to put all the bottom back in and it was fine. But it was like so weird to hear it in my car and be like, Wait, where's the fucking bass drum? What happened? You know, so that happens a lot, you know, that, that, and that's the problem with not having the relationship with, with, the, um, with the mixer, you know, mastering mixer thing. There's no understanding that, you know, this is what he, you're going for. I have, I mean, I do a lot of cheap projects, um, or, you know, my fair share. And it's not so much anymore, oh, we've got a guy. It's more like, we kind of don't understand at all why we master and if we're going to do it, we want to do it really cheaply. So, and that's okay if you, you know, there are some, there are some people out there that work, you know, at, at certainly at more reasonable rates that I trust, but you know, it's, it, it's a lot of the, you know, a lot of the people like Greg who are really, who I've had a long relationship with are not cheap, you know, I mean, I know they'll all, people are a little more flexible these days than they used to be because, because of how the, the process has changed. But uh, I, I don't run into getting somebody demanding we use a certain person. It's more like, well, why am I even doing this? And so hopefully this conversation will explain to people how you it isn't supposed to sound radically different. It is supposed to just be, as Dave said, another set of ears, somebody who's who listens to a lot of records and has been waiting, and they don't have to be as experienced as Greg. There's a lot of newer engineers that are really good. Uh, I, and there's this woman, Heba Kadri, who's really great. Uh, she was yeah. in Brooklyn. Uh, there's a lot of people doing newer projects, and they're you know not not always a lot cheaper, but there's certainly other options out there that doesn't it doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. Or and I, I I won't get too crazy about how I don't think you should do it yourself. It doesn't work for me. I wouldn't do it. Uh, but it it just having the other having an experienced person who has just heard a million records and knows what to do is a is a big it's a way bigger thing than you think uh, and that, they don't have to get your project even they don't have to be like i'm totally down with this kind of music this is you know this is what i live for uh, as a mastering engineer they just need to be really good at what they do and that what they do is make all records better in any genre because they know what they're doing <laughs> and they're Sometimes. not you <laughs> Sometimes, Greg, you, you've kindly said at the end of a session, wow, I feel I feel bad we didn't do anything. And, and I said, <laughs> you did. This is part of the process for you just to, to sit in your room on your speakers with your ears and say, it's good. That's 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 worth a lot. So. That's that's the most well, important I, I thing about Peter, it. You want to get, you know, the I mean, most I, important I told thing. Peter, I told Peter recently that he, you know, it's it, I mean, because he because he mixes. He mixes through his his compression and his bus and everything. I mean, the level that he gets is 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 appropriate and loud and punchy, and and the the process that we've had and it's similar to what what I've done with John. With I've done that with you, where just try to see what happens if you just put a couple of inserts in the chain and just see if it enhances what he's already done. But for for a long time, I had that L two because you were mixing through the L two. Right. So if we, if we went through, this is with the hardware L2. So if we went through my, my console and my wires or whatever, somehow I was getting a little bit more movement. I mean, it's just, it didn't change the, didn't change the EQ at all, but it just was a little bit more dynamic, a little more spongy sounding. Right. And, but lately, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm getting less and less of an improvement by trying to go through my stuff on your stuff. And I told you recently, I said, you know what, I think you, I think you're done. I think you, gra you, you graduated from me. I mean, you can just give it to anybody and just tell them, don't do anything, just manufacture. But that's, you know, that's because the process, each one of you guys has a different process before that, you know, and, and, you know, I could, I could, you know, we could, I could talk to each of you how different you are in terms of what, when I, what I hear and what you need. And also, you know, like in the case of Dave, who the producer is and what the producer wants and what he expects from, you know, whether it's part of the process or the last part of the process. Um, am I in the preservation business or am I in the enhancement business? You know, oh, right. some you people, know. you know, people come to me, this, I know you're not going to ruin my record. I said, great. That's a, That's I'm, I'll take that one. Long Can I say, say one thing about that? Sorry, the um, I think yeah, I was on the second Interpol record where the band kept coming back saying they they weren't happy with the mastering, and then finally one of them that you did a couple of revisions, made it louder, whatever, and uh, they and the guy said um, we just like the mixes better that you know uh, that came out of your studio the day before mastering than any of the mastered mixes, and I said to you, 
you may not think so, but I think it's the L2 because you weren't using any L2. I, I think that, that because I mixed through it, hearing it, when I took yeah. it off and gave it to you, they missed that. And you're like, uh, you're like, I don't think so, whatever. But then this is the old days too. So you, you did a mix, you FedEx me a CD. And I remember I walked right into where I'm sitting right now. I put the CD in and I played it back. It's like, that's it. And then like almost in the moment I said that, you called me. I was like, and you go, you are right. It's the L2. It's just like, because it did something that, it's not a question of right or wrong. We made all these creative and sonic decisions listening through this thing, you know? And so it's not because the L2 is good at all. It's just that that's what we were hearing. And so to, to finish up, I think we've had a harder time lately in some of these records where I'm using, it's not even relevant, but I'm using a different limiter. I'm using the universal audio precision limiter at the end, end doing 5 dB of limiting. Now, mm -hmm. I'm maybe a little embarrassed to say, uh, as we were talking about volume wars, volume wars are strong and crazy as ever. And um, I'm yeah. probably hitting that limiter significantly harder than I used to. So when you take that limiter off and, and you may make up all that level, you may make up you know, even a little more, um, like this one record you mastered, this band, The Get Up Kids, which is like a rock and record, heavy guitars, hard snare. It, without the, without the precision limiter on, um, it just, the snare drum sounded terrible. It sounded totally different. And I remember you saying, well, doesn't the mix sound better? And it did sound better, more open. Up. But the snare, and that I, I run through, I do this all the time when, because of the crazy uh, chain of latency and stuff. A lot of times I can't overdub with my aux mix on. And so when I take that off, the snare drum sounds terrible. It's hard, it's hard to explain, but the, like, I think it's because it just changes the, the transient, you know? And um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, it's such a problem now. So what, I, what I've done lately is I've given you the mix not 5 dB down. I've given it to you just 2 dB down because if I don't put, or now you have that plugin and you can compare it. But, but right. it honestly made the snare drum sound stupid, which is just so weird. Yeah. One thing, I, Greg, you've this, I, may, I hope this doesn't make you cringe. One thing you can do if you're kind of not sure about what mastering is doing is ask the mastering engineer to make a flat copy of what you send them just level matched. So when you mm -hmm. get back the, the, mix, the master, you can listen to the mastering and also listen to the, your own mix is kind of closer level wise to what the mastering is. Because in general, a lot of people are confused by it just being louder and you can actually hear the subtleties if you have someone who's more inclined to AB, things like that. I know it's extra work for, but you know, you're doing it anyway. It's just <laughs> bypassing the EQs. But. Well, it's it's always good, you know. I I always try to initiate a dialogue when when it when I think that it's going to move things forward a little bit. I have been I've actually, uh, you know, we get so many things in here. Just one song, two songs. Yeah, you know, and when I had two the other day, I had one from Russia and one from Israel, and you know, I don't know what I don't know what they're looking for, you know, and they don't tell me that. And so I, I do I do two or three different versions and just label them, you know. This has more compression. This is louder more vocal, what again, let them, let them play with it, you know, and then kind of get back to me. So try to initiate what would, what would, what would happen in the room. It doesn't take that long when you, when you're working in the box, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do another full pass in three or four minutes. Right. So, um, but, um, I, I yeah, this is something maybe for not so much for you guys as much as for the audience, but I recently got a record that was really, I'm not going to mention it, the name of the record, but it was really sounded horrible. It really sounded miserable. And I, I did as much as I could with it, but I just, I just felt, I even called the label up and was really concerned about it. I said, please check these out really closely. And then the, um, the, mic, the mixer calls me up and she said, um, it's, uh, what did you do? It sounds so different than what we've been listening to. I said, I, said, I, didn't, I, I just did a little bit to the bottom. It was the exact opposite kind of what I did. I said, well, have you sent everybody the loud versions? Oh, oh yeah, didn't I send you the loud versions? I said, no, I just had the low level version. Did you give the, did you give everybody the loud versions? She said, oh, I guess I should send them to you. I said, duh. Okay. So she sends them, right? Not only compressed, but EQ'd the shit out of it. Everybody was listening to this record so much brighter than, the, the, than what I got that even though I added some brightness to it, she was adding like four or five dB of 10K on everything that she was giving everybody. And then I was, I got this super mur murky dull thing and I'm going like, oh my God. Let me, let me brighten it up, but I guess they like it warm, you know? So you, you got to make sure that the, who's ever mastering your record, boys and girls out there, make sure that the mastering engineer knows what your, your musicians and your label and everyone in the chain has been listening to. So he can, he can figure out what, what the frame of reference is because that raw material, 
that mix that hasn't been treated with all that stuff doesn't mean anything if, if, if you don't know where you went with it to give it out to everybody. And this is the same thing that a lot of you guys do anyway, but you do it before the client gets it. And, and, and you, you know, you've been sending me the two different levels, depending again on kind of bus compression and everything. Dave, your mixes are always loud, uh, loud enough. There's headroom, I, you know, you don't need to crush them and you can make them a little bit louder and they sound a little bit better. You know, some people mix really super low. I mean, everybody has their own style. So I, th I think that's one thing about, about mastering. You gotta be really flexible. You know, you gotta be really flexible yeah. in a lot of communication. Stuart. Right. So, um, you know, we're talking a lot about the technical side of mastering and, and kind of not really addressing the, really the musical part of it, you know? And one thing that I rely on with you partially because I know your musical taste. But like, for instance, vocal level, right? You can listen to a million different records that have different vocal levels. Yep. And um, at what point would you, do you get involved with that? I know we do that, but, um, and there's no right or wrong there, obviously. You know, we love great records from Mick Jagger, who was like this, to Chrissy Hine, who was like that, or- right. Leonard Cohen, is that ever something that you approach with people who just come in yeah. off the street? Or, yeah. yeah, that's the one. That's the one thing that I just I, I'm ne never shy about saying. Either the vocals are buried or the vocals are too loud. I just I just I feel I feel like it's a very personal it's personal taste. I like to get inside the project a little more, and I always say, okay, let, can I just tell from my from my perspective, these this sounds like vocal plus three to me. And there's a reason why you want the vocals so loud. And I, the answer that I get, sometimes there's a whole long story about the singer. If the vocals are too low, it could be, you know, mouth noises. The singer was very, you know, very self-conscious. I'd like to get inside that, but I, 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 ne I never hesitate to say when a vocal is in the wrong position. And, you know, even, I, you know, it's, it's just funny to tell the story, but back, back in the 70s, when I worked with John Lennon, it was on that rock and roll album. I mean, I'm 24 years old and I'm talking to a Beatle, right? And I said, John, I said, these vocals are buried. I said, I can't hear anything. This is ridiculous. He said, oh, rubbish, rubbish, they're rubbish. I don't want them loud. I said, and I turned to him and I said, you are the greatest singer in the history of rock and roll. That's what I told him. I said, you're the greatest singer in the history of rock and roll. Why wouldn't you want it loud? And he says, oh, it's rubbish, rubbish. And he just, you know, whatever. But I just, I, you know, but it, like you said, sometimes you listen to an, you listen to an album. I remember listening to a, uh, Annie Lennox uh, record, a solo record. It's like vocal plus five. I mean, it was like, oh my God, it's like so much. But it's Annie Lennox, one of the greatest voices, right? So it's, uh, you know, and, and then the mixes, I'm sure it's the same conversation with a, either a singer who's self-conscious about certain things about their range or about their, their pitchiness or whatever. Well, well, although pitchiness is a thing of the past now, right guys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I'm kidding>. Magic. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Not really. The record I'm mixing now, there's no no tuning of vocals. It's a lot of no three tuning. and four part harmony, but a lot of work put into it. Wait, are they so are they pitchy or they don't care? Or are they not pitchy? No, they work really hard and get it just right. Yeah, yeah that's a oh, pitchy end. It hasn't care. happened in a long time. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is you know, this is part of my, you know, when I started doing, you know, mastering, I, I really thought that I wanted to be a record producer until you know, I started making a living doing the cutting and, you know, liking the money and the steady work and everything. So I never got into it, but I have that, I have the producer bone in me. I mean, I listen to records sometime like a producer. Uh, I'm, I'm not a very technical person in general. I don't have a fancy system at home. I'm not, you know, I listen to, I'm a music, I'm really a music person more than a, a, a person with sonics. But when I get placed in the, in the position of needing to make decisions like that, then, then I kind of get into it. But, uh, I tell you, the greatest gift has been, you know, James bringing me these unbelievable musician musicians. You know, they, they, they just the, the best guys of the generation. Dave, you know, Dave Holland, right, and uh, Brad Meldow, and you know, Sco and Mike Brecker. I mean, come on, I man, how, when was I going to be able to meet these people? You know, other than in the studio mastering. You know, and uh, I, I think I think. James, I always tell, like, but let me get a little aside for a second, because I actually think it's interesting. I remember, and I've told this story, that Mike Brecker, who had the best intonation, the best skill of, a, of, a, like of, of, a, of a generation, right, in, in the instrument, we used to add like brightness and say to him, Mike, what do you think? You like, you like this or that? And he would just shake his head, go like, I don't know, I don't, I don't hear, you know, he's not, he's not like listening to that. He wasn't listening for, for sonics. 
in my memory, you straighten me out if I'm wrong. He, he wasn't, wasn't comfortable uh, judging things on the spot. He would say, I'm not a mastery guy or when we're mixing, I'm not a mixy guy, but it, <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't know when he got it home. And, and that's always yeah. hard for, for, what, for us engineers when we're working, if somebody can't tell while you're working, if they're there. I mean, some you guys do a lot of things unattended. I'm always working with somebody. Um, and, uh, but he just didn't have the, the confidence. It wasn't, um, you know, and, I, and uh, judging from Michael Brecker's saxophone sound, I don't think we ever had a treble. Uh, I think that would have been probably a wrong thing to do. But, um, you know, he, he really didn't have the confidence. And he sometimes wondered what's he doing there, but he, but he liked to hang. And also, yeah. me included and the artists, we like to hear the music on a, an ex, a stereo that's way more expensive than we're ever going to hear it on again, <laughs> oh, yeah. at least once, that one day. And the, the thing is that when... It's, it's a good stereo like that, um, even though it's going to have more than what we're going to hear elsewhere, the, it's, the character is not going to be different elsewhere. So that's why you can trust it. Um, but that, you know, yeah, so, so you know, like uh, somebody was, Stuart was asking earlier, can everybody hear the difference when you change a wire? And it's funny, some people have really good ears, can't, and others can, and Sometimes like there are certain things like we've compared like different dither settings and you said, I don't know, I don't really hear that. And to me, it's like drastic. So certain things yeah, stick yeah. out to different people, but not yeah. to everybody. And it's, it's yeah. not clear why that is. Um, yeah, but ma mastering is the reward. It's the reward for mixing, right? You go, you're for the first time in this process, you are not responsible. You are, and you sit there <laughs> and, you, and then- to therapy. Yeah, and when you play back the whole record of you know loud and the big speakers, that's yeah, that's the reward. And then you go get drunk with uh, Pat and Thomas Barlett. It's uh, <laughs> right. And get, and get home late to your right. service. If, if I could add something from um, what what people were saying earlier, one of the, the the most important thing in a mastering engineer to me is that they don't have an agenda um, to yes. try and superimpose something on the music and your work, and the good mastering engineers know when they get something, if it's good, like Peter sends some Greg something and it's good. And he says, okay, I'm not going to touch this. Or, you know, in another situation, he's going to get something like he said, it was a horrible sounding record where he knew we had to save the project, turn a lot of dials and make something more out of this than what was given him. That's the critical thing that most master mastering engineers, especially uh, newer ones who don't have the experience don't know and need to learn, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think it's not just about, it's not just about experience, right? It's also like there there are this sort of this not Rushmore of of mastering guys that that Greg is on, and there there are, there are people trying to become known as mastering people, and they some I think some people mistakenly think they need to make a big change so that the artist will say Absolutely. that's even better. But it, the times you're going to get that where you, you know, if you get one out of 10 where you do something drastic and they love it, that's, that's great. But that's not, I think that's, that's probably not going to even happen one out of 10 times. You're better off actually listening to the project, trying to figure out what it is and make it better at what it is, not at what you want it to be. And that's, that's I once uh, mixed a record in Paris and I went to the mastering session and so it was to tape and this guy hit play and within three minutes, he had like three compressors, three limiters and four equalizers doing all this crazy stuff. And uh, I, I said, um, okay, well, hold on a second. Can you just remove this? And can you remove that? And you re one by one. And I said, okay, back to like when it was all gone. I said, okay, let's start now. You know, <laughs> this is what you need to listen to and get used to before you start to change it. You, mm -hmm. you have to, if, if it needs something fine, but you have to at least get used to what it is before you want to make it something different. Yeah, I think it's always important if you, if you do attend the mastering session to let the mastering person have time on their own first. I mean, you can tell them what you're looking for, but allow them to listen on their own for a while to 
just become right. familiar. You know, you know the music inside out. They're just hearing it for the first time. You send it to them ahead of time, or if, if you're bringing it, give them time to listen alone in their room and, you know, without looking over their shoulder and let them come back to you with what, what they think it needs. Um, obviously, James's experience is the opposite of that, where they just piled on a bunch of stuff <laughs> right away. Well, that was an example where at that time in Paris, because I had worked there quite a bit on a few things, the only people that mastering engineers had to answer to was the label. There was never artist or engineer interaction with mastering engineers. So that's why they felt like, well, if I only need to impress the label, the more things I do, that's going to do that. And they had to learn over the years how to work with uh, with artists and, and engineers. Uh, the first time I worked in Paris, um, I, we set up, we recorded the take and the guys came into the control room and I said, what do you think? And they all looked at each other and they said, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. You're the first engineer who asked us what we thought. <laughs> so. I have a question for everybody. I think when I'm mixing, this may go back to from many years ago, but I always tend to leave a little room for the mastering guy to add the last bit of high end. Yes. Because I think they'll get it right. And I also think you can't, it's a lot harder to take it off than to, to add any. To, to Nobody take will ever out. take it off. <laughs> right, Greg? <laughs> it Not doesn't anymore. sound, it's, it's, it's better off adding a little and trying to take it away. Taking it away is, is it's, it's, it's tricky. It's but, tricky. But Dave, I, I'm with you on that. Just true though. It's that true. little it's air smoother. that's left, let them do. Yeah. Even if I think I know what it should be, I'll, right. I'm, I may not do it and I'll ask them to not on do tape it. too, yeah. Yeah, it's also it's also nice uh, ear candy for the client when they get the mastering back. Even if you do nothing except just make it a little brighter, it's like it just livens it up a little bit, you know. It's a, as opposed to the reverse, which is like, oh, it, it lost the excitement or whatever, you know. <laughs> but so, today, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, right. But what's that? I, I try to go all the way there. I just because I'm always so afraid if I don't get it right, <laughs> you know, there's there are no guarantees, and of course, anyone can add high end, but yeah, it's so hard and. I, I think I stopped bringing tape to you, Greg, when um, I basically had the same limiter, the same converter, the same, like I had all the same stuff you had. So yeah, right, it's so right, much, right. you know, to load it in at least, but yeah, it's so hard to say. I think it's it's such a stream. I don't want to derail this conversation. I we're probably almost done, but um, at some point I'd love to talk to people like you about the whole, of course it's the volume wars thing, but the thing with, with streaming now and the different platforms and I, I'm just, I'm totally confused. And like a lot of people have said here, I'm not a technical guy. I've always been, you know, guy works more on instincts and about the music and, and cares a lot about sonics, but it's from a creative standpoint, not a technical one. And, and I'm, I'm just totally lost. And when people say stuff like, oh, well, for streaming, we'll, we'll turn it down. And that actually makes it louder. Like, that's never been true and it will never be true. Like, I, I still find mixes are loud or they're not loud, you know? And so I, I do understand that if you make it especially loud and it gets turned down, it's very disappointing. But for, that's a talk for another time, but I, I, I need to have that conversation. So. That's an important but, you know, conversation. Actually, that would, be a, that would be a good conversation in, in, in a separate one of these. To tr but to try to get some people who are musical in these streaming services is, is freaking impossible because it's just not, they're not really music companies and they're all that, they're, it's all data and data storage and compression of data because you know, when you have like 20 million songs, if there's a way that you can kind of squeeze the data a little bit, it's so much cheaper to store. And I had, you know, I forgot which which service. There was one that, uh, man, I forgot. It was about two years ago. This guy was explaining to me all this stuff. And when they start talking about packets and storage and everything, they're not, they're not, there's all this level stuff that we care about. It's not like a radio station. These these are not, and they're all and they all sound different. I mean, title. Yeah. To me, Tidal, I just got to say, Tidal, I have it on my phone. A band comes in here. I get a thing. I go on Tidal. I see what their last record. I see the exact level. I see the, the EQ sounds great. It sounds full. It sounds rich. I listen to something that I did like a year ago. I compare it to my file on a computer. can barely hear the difference. 
I'm good to go with title. Anybody tells me something doesn't sound good on Spotify, I said, call Spotify. It's not my problem. I mean, I don't know what they're doing. And I can't, I'm not going to compensate your mix to try to get it to sound good. All I know is that on Spotify, they bring everything down to a certain level. So if you've compressed, you're not getting the benefit of the of the level and you're getting the the what's ruined about getting compressed, which is all your rhythms and all your bases and that there's no movement. So you kind of you kind of don't really need to do it. So there has been in some ways a, a movement away from the super, super loud, but it just depends on the people and what they've listened to, what their experience was. God forbid somebody's in a playlist and their thing comes down a little bit low, they freak out. I mean, it's yeah. like, wow, terrible. But, Why'd that happen? Yeah. They called me up. Why did it happen? I said, you know what? I have really, I, I hate to say, but I have no idea. Well, my so. experience is exactly the same. Uh, uh, title sounds, sounds good. And Spotify, yep. I remember the first time a bunch of years ago, I went on Spotify to compare what I was mixing to, to other things. And, and after an hour or so, I was like, man, I'm a badass. I'm just kicking <laughs> all these ass mixes, asses. Bad. And I was like, wait a minute. And I, I went and listened to something that I had mixed and I was very disappointed. It, it sounded really bad. And it, like people say, oh, that's just because you're an audiophile. No, 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 no. It sounded really bad. And now here's the crazy thing. If you pay for the upgrade to the better Sonics, they don't turn it on. Like you've got to find that parameter in Spotify and turn it, it on. Right. Even, so it's, right. it's weird. It's weird stuff. Have you guys checked out Master Check Pro by Nugent? No, say that again. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nugent Audio make this plugin called Master Check Pro. It's interesting. You can put it on your mix and it auditions all the codecs from all the different streaming services. Gonna write that down. Ah. And what's really interesting on it is you can actually solo the Finally, difference. Finally, some useful information in this. <laughs> so you, you can so you can <laughs> solo the difference. This was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can solo the difference and hear what it is is being taken out of the yeah. final AAC or MP3 or whatever it is. And it is staggering how much audio is being removed from your mix. Like it, it, it's actually quite depressing. So be careful, you know. <laughs> but you choose your day that you do this. It could put you over the edge. Is, well, but it's a do you find any are any of them better? Than, I mean, I think Title is the best one I've heard about. Have you tried Tidal Amazon? For, yeah, I mean, to my ear, Title for sure. And when you check it out in this plugin and you solo the difference, Title removes yeah. the least. Like it's it's pretty much yeah. spot on. You yeah. know, but I mean, like Spotify, the mobile version, it has different codecs for mobile and desktop and high res and all of that. The mobile version is. It's really depressing. Huh. Or how about Sirius XMU, like Sirius Radio? I, I got in a, like an after party and a conversation with someone who worked there. And I just, I think, I don't, maybe we were drinking, whatever, but I was like, I just told them how terrible the station sounds, like the XMU channel 35. I've heard some, I, I feel like it varies from day to day too. There are some days where I, I don't even think it was in stereo. I don't know what was going on, but. And some music sounds great, and some, but a lot of music sounds terrible. Like electronic music tends to sound better, but but uh, regular yeah. organic or you know acoustic music can sound like yeah. there's just something terribly wrong. It's which anything is terrible. with dissonance or like odd harmonics in it is a tougher tougher deal. If it yeah. samples and everything is like so pure, yeah. Like yeah, that works. Yeah, exactly for sure. So who gets to hear your actual mix anymore? <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. Is that who who gets to hear it other than your client you on their like you. Said, the, yeah. mastering. That's it. Once you've heard mastering, you're <laughs> Stuart, have you gotten any any questions from anybody, or is everybody falling asleep already? Yeah, there's a lot of questions. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there's one for Dave, and I, I, I'm you know you can answer them or not or whatever. Uh, <laughs> So is it, what frequency do you cut in the mids to get that James Taylor sound? I'm struggling to replicate it using an Olsen SJ and a Pendulum SPS acoustic preamp. And I would say maybe you just get James over to the house. That might help. <laughs> but, but, it's, it's true where the sound is in the fingers, you yeah. know, and like uh, put a different person playing is is a different we all know this everybody anybody could play the same guitar it'll all sound different like sitting down at a drum kit is probably the most obvious example one guy will sound one way exact same kit will be another but i think a, maybe a huge thing in recording acoustic guitars as we all know is how far is how close the mic is to the instrument and the precedence effect and the closer you get where where it is in terms of the let's say the sound hole and left and right and back and forward and just 
with a decent mic, you should be able to get a great sound with, with minimal EQ. What, what about so, the, the like the key of the song, the tuning, uh, the capo yeah. position? All that, that all changes the fundamental of the of the instrument. It does, the key especially. And James will use different guitars and he'll capo in different positions. And I, you know, in the last couple of records, we've been so fine-tuned in that his guitar tech, you know, James has several of these Olsons now. James will, will start running the song down and the guitar tech, JP, who's great, will go, I think guitar number three would be good for this tune. And I'm just like, let's hear it, you know, he, cause he, cause they all sound different cause they're different ages. So they've been played a different amount and, you know, uh, they, they all have a different feel and a different tone, but experiment with mic position. You should be able to get what you want for the right. most part. Right. Um, that's one, that's one artist that never made a bad, not even close to a bad, every, bad sounding every james taylor album sounded great and from the very beginning right it's absolutely yeah. incredible so beautiful you know james you did a couple of a couple of them they all sound me i mean he must have just such an instinct for arrangement and tuning and keys he appreciates, and whatever it is. yeah he Incredible. appreciates all that you know james he appreciates yeah. all that and he appreciates what the musicians and engineers bring to it but he wants them to sound good you yeah. know you know, you know, I have a question for, for James and for Dave who worked with James Taylor. In terms of, I mean, I can't recall, I, I don't know the full body of his work, I'm a fan, but I can't recall him strumming an acoustic guitar, right? Me neither. And that's a no. huge sonic thing when you work Never with thought about it, but you're right. And, no, and only the, the, the fingers flicking down a little exactly. bit. Exactly. But, but no it's, strumming. it's a huge sonic element. A strumming acoustic guitar is, it could be massive and it could, it could eat all the air out of a track if it's not done kind of in a, yeah. a way that's complementary to the other instruments. But it always occurred, I mean, he's like a consummate finger picker. And, and his records have a sound, I think, partially because he's not scratching away definitely i mean also the, the arrangements the arrangements for most of the songs in my experience come from the acoustic guitar part so what he's playing with the thumb will be distributed to the bass player and certain harmonies that are happening here will be covered by the keyboard player and sometimes you know in the mix he except for some sections he doesn't even have to be that loud but everybody's reflecting what he came up with as the basis for that song i don't know if you would agree with that dave definitely it's definitely, definitely the, the, all the harmonic content is kind of in what he's playing. And, and he has a very sophisticated, you know, he has a, like a jazz guy ear for, for chords. They're not just triads. No, very, very much so. It's amazing to me how, <laughs> how musical he really is. Yeah. It's stunning. And he is a very dynamic player too, though. It, it can be loud and quiet, which, which Stuart is part of the answer to that question. Right. I have a question for you guys. Yeah. Um, your clients say, what do masters do? What do you tell them? Because I have a thing I tell my, you know, usually younger kids who aren't used to like albums and albums of having mastering engineers and now with programs and stuff, you know, they don't really understand what, but you know, when someone says, you know, so what's the mastering guy do? What do you tell them? You know, for one of the things, I mean, if, if albums matter anymore and maybe they don't, but they do in my world first they got to put it together uh make your songs into a you know into an album form but I'll also make the relative levels even and in the end you want that you want it to be a little bit if you did a good job you want it to just be a little bit better than what you did um that's that's the main thing um you know the relative level thing is, if for an album's point of view, is extremely important. Uh, one, uh, this is a side comment, but something I do that I, I think, I don't know if this would work in, in the pop music where everything's so dynamically restricted, but when I mix, I start mixing every tune at the loudest point in the tune. I get my, get my gain structure together there. When I go to mastering, there's often no adjustment from one song to the next between a level or if there is, there's a half a dB. But basically I, I, it's, um, 
you know, it's, it's basically, for me, it's a matter of preserving and enhancing a little bit, uh, not to be, um, also, I never give anybody an elevated level mix. I, they get zero view, that's what they take home. And you guys couldn't do that. I don't think in your world people would freak out, but I just say, this is the mix. It'll be louder when, when it's mastered and then it'll be way louder. And, and when it's done right, they'll be really impressed. But the, the, um, that's one of the things that has to happen on my mixes that they've got to be made substantially louder uh, at the mastering phase. Yeah, I mean, also like what I want to steal what Dave said, but it's, it's I think we probably all agree it's better to have an experienced set of ears on it that isn't you. You know, it's it's good to have a sense of second opinion by somebody who has done it for a long time. That's why I like to use Greg, but it's. No, there are plenty of people who are newer at it that that are that are also very good at uh, being that second opinion and having, you know, hearing things. The important thing is that they hear it as you're trying to hear it and work with you to make it more of what you're doing, not try and make it different. What um, do you mean? Was that a lead? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I would I would tell a, a young person something like you know I mean if they don't if they're not really technical just like you know. Uh, to to bring the, the what comes out of the studio or comes out of the computer to a consumer level without and enhancing it rather than sacrificing it because that stage between what it's going to be listened to out in the market and what happens from the from the creative people in the studio something can really be ruined on the way over and and not only can be not ruined, but it can actually be enhanced by the person with the right ear. So, I mean, to me, that I mean, I've, I've spoken to so many people at parties where they go like, oh, what is mastering? You know, the, the insurance guy has no idea. And I just say, you know, I always say it become, it just be, make it sound more vivid and clearer and also make it cohesive so you can listen to the songs together and also can be listened to outside of the studio at a pleasing level. And I mean, I, I, and if somebody gets that, they get it. If they don't, they don't. And, you know, it depends. You get the feedback from them as to what their sensitivity is and stuff. And then you can kind of get it further. But uh, hey, Greg, you, know, Greg, you just never, never know. Speaking of listening outside of the studio, we just got hit by uh, by our buddy Chris Allen over at Sear. And Hi, his Chris. Question, All right. Great, hey, great engineer. Um, he, he's got a question. Uh, he's just wondering about when you guys are listening to music for enjoyment, outside of the studio, what systems do you listen on? Hmm. I don't listen for enjoyment anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> I listen well, my to wife podcasts makes fun a of lot. Me. <laughs> my wife makes fun of me that when I'm in the car, I never want to listen to music, except yeah. for my own mixes. I'm sorry, honey. NPR are my mixes. But, um, <laughs> but well, like I said, I own Ted Jensen's BMW 801s now. And they're unbelievable to listen to. What's so embarrassing, though, is I don't listen to them that often. Uh, but I don't know why. I can't answer that. But also, my son, since the quarantine started, has taken over that room to play Fortnite. So, anyway. <laughs> Ted would be happy. In the car, <laughs> I would say. I don't. In the car. Car, yeah. In, in yeah. Car. And I have a just a mono sono speaker that sounds pretty good, that thing. Really? I'm like, oh, I got to get a second one so I have stereo. But <laughs> Yeah, I, I hate mono, man. Yeah, it doesn't. I it doesn't... don't have a stereo at home. Oh, really? When I leave the studio, it's these guys. Yeah. That's pretty much wow. it. You know, if I leave the studio and I want to listen to something that I've worked on, I'll go to my Bose because they make me sound good. And I, I, I know that they're not right. But if I don't want to bum out at the end of the night and like really go, fuck, I'll listen on something that kind of is over flattering in some way. Yeah. Um, so. It's just so it's just my kind of psychological depressive nature. I go for something hyped. You know, in the late seventies, when I first started uh, mastering with Greg, and I would go to his room, uh, his original room at Sterling <laughs> uh, in Midtown, he had a set of these Canton speakers, white so, ones. So I said, uh, "I'm going to get a set of Canton speakers." <laughs> so I got them, and I still have them to this day. He doesn't have them anymore, but, uh, oh, no. and they're great. Uh, and I, I haven't changed since. And you've heard my system and it's not a very expensive stereo. Uh, the whole thing, um, all the components in the speakers probably is like 
five thousand dollars and to some kid who might be listening to it that sounds like a lot of money but compared to greg's let's say at least hundred thousand dollars stereo it's not a lot of money for a stereo and but it sounds good because everything is matched if i changed one thing up a, a level then everything would have to come or it would point out a deficiency early on and i i use radio shack wire which uh i swear by <laughs> and it's a very comfortable listen in there it's uh you know i think it, it uh i about, when i got a new phone last year they said you qualify for a, a, for a free uh blah 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 and they showed me a couple of things and they had this one speaker called a boom three it's like a cylinder it's about it's about maybe 10, 10 inches and you know maybe i don't know six inches in diameter you just stick it on the table damn if it doesn't sound good and you bring it outside and listen so you know this way i don't have to start scrutinizing treble bass where it just sounds like music man so i don't yeah. i rest my ears at home and i think that all of us who make a living by sitting in one spot and listening to speakers work do you really want to go home and have a stereo system and be able to sit there between the speakers i don't not I want to keep all. moving around, man. I want to eat. I want to, you know, watch television. That's why the car is really the the, the ultimate. But uh, you know, I never really took the trouble to really soup up any of my cars. I don't know if you guys did, but I think that then you're in one spot, and then you know. But it's, you know, you got to be the kind of guy who wants to rip out the, the speakers out of the doors, and then go to the guy down the corner, and then he puts in some subwoofer in the back of the trunk, and then you can't put your other shit in there because the subwoofer is in there. It's like I'm not doing that, you know. Does anyone consider what car they're gonna buy? Like, do you, if you're going to buy a car, do you go in and sit and listen to the speaker? Or do you go? Oh, I, I did that with the Mini, the Mini Cooper. I actually, I, I got an upgrade on the Mini Cooper one six years ago because the sound system was terrible. And the upgrade was awful. And I, I regretted it because the sound system was terrible in there. And uh, I just kind of feel once I know, leave the studio, I'm only listening to the song at that point and not the audio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Ideally. You, kind of that way. you can't. You know, otherwise you'll be working. If you have a perfectly balanced system, either in your car or at home, after you come home from work, you're going to listen and, and you've already gone through that mental process. Don't you want to just enjoy music at that point? That's why I don't even, I don't really yeah. fuck with hi-fi at all. That's why Maybe I just I'm... listen to uh, Gear Club podcasts at home. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Gear Club, speaking of which, I, I have to kind of sign off. I know I'm uh, running done, this thing. You've got I, this beautiful I, way over time. And this I got some work to do, so yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> Did it, was the mission accomplished? Is anybody, did anybody not get to say something that they might have wanted to say because I talked over them or we, we didn't cover it? I mean, we didn't go into the level wars. I think that, you know, we could do and that some other time. I think Pat mentioned um, uh, Mount Rushmore. So the great George Marino, who we all know and love, oh. Oh, I was yeah. once mastering with him and, uh, and I was kind of a little nervous about, you know, what was going on. And he said, listen, so, um, so I got a friend who's a brain surgeon and he's working on a patient and he's like, and, and he's working across with another doctor and the other doctor says, man, I'm kind of like, this is, I'm a little nervous about this. And the brain surgeon says, hey, don't worry. It's not like it's mastering. <laughs> good. George, okay. George sure told you that, that's a good one. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, for Don't next time, I, Pat, if you could improve the uh, acoustics in your room, that'd be good. I think you're in the um, 100. Yeah. Am I echoing? Too echo? <laughs> you want less reverb? Yeah. <laughs> I can dampen it. I get some tube traps here. There you go. I gain a little I just, more weight. I want to thank, I I thank everybody. This is such, it's such a great group. And maybe if we ever, ever, ever can ever see each other at a big dinner table again, my treat will go to Latanzi one night, get a big table. Of 46 Street and have some food together. Feet right? apart, and I'm, and I'm not going to forget little. that offer. All right. Mm -hmm. James all right. and I've been there many and times. Good idea, all right? All you we'll guys. You up on it. And, and and James, I'll never call you Jim again. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. Great thanks, to see Greg. you. Johnny, all right. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Everybody. All right. Bye bye.